Today we are continuing in our series, What the World Needs Now. We, we are nearly done. Not that we're done with the things that the world needs. Man, the world needs so much. Uh, and what we're talking about today is what the world needs now is more joy. And in particular, the world needs now for you to be living in the joy that you have in Jesus. And I mean like that, that fullness of joy. I mean that overflowing kind of joy. I mean the joy that uh, is, is not the joy found in the world, not the joy found from circumstances, not the joy that is uh, dependent on um, you know, material things, but that joy that comes from God himself. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. The Bible talks about joy, I mean, throughout the Bible, but in particular in the New Testament. Man, Jesus talks about joy. The, uh, apostle, the, the apostles talk about joy all, of the, all throughout Scripture, lots and lots of joy. We're going to have a look at what does Scripture say about joy. Uh, I mean, even, in, again, in the fruit of the Spirit comes right after love. Love, preeminent, prominent. God is love. Fruit of the Spirit, they are working in the Spirit, primarily love and joy comes right after love. John 15, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full, that your joy may be complete. 1 John 3, uh, That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus. And we are writing these things to you so that our joy may be full. So John writing to people who he loves so that his own joy may be full. In fact, their, their joy as well. Everybody's joy may be full as they're rejoicing in the fellowship with the Father and with the Son through the Spirit. Psalm 32, be glad in the Lord and rejoice. O righteous, shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Um, Paul echoes this, Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I say again, rejoice, all the time rejoicing, all the time full of joy. Uh, Nehemiah 8, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Even Job, uh, he, Job 8.21, he will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. I mean, lots and lots and lots more of these things. Isaiah 12, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. John 16, until now you've been asking, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Again, Jesus is saying, ask me. Uh, what he wants for you is for your joy and for your joy to be full. This is, this is one of the, the key contentions from, uh, from my sermon today, but I think also from scripture. We see this from Jesus' own mouth. We see this uh, from this Holy Spirit-inspired words throughout the rest of Scripture, that the, that the Holy Spirit wants for your joy to be full. Jesus wants for your joy to be full. The Father wants your joy to be full. And, and part of what they are doing, and part of what we've seen throughout this series, and even through the Romans 8 series, is that as God is working and outworking in your life, uh, one of the things He is so keen to do, we looked at holiness, absolutely. He, he wants for your holiness. He wants for your Christ-likeness. And He wants for your joy. And in fact, we'll see today, your joy really is found in your uh, Christ-likeness and in what God has done for you. So my key passage today, not really well known as the passage of joy, but I'll, it is a very, very well-known piece of scripture. So I want to uh, I'll read this out for you now. We'll get stuck into it and see what God might have for us today. Let's, let's have a read. It's from Luke 15. Uh, you'll, you'll see which passage it is really far. It's a very, very well-known piece of scripture. And he said, Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that's coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Now, not many days later, the young son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. Verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your servants, one of your slaves. And he rose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, 
bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. They all celebrated. <clears throat> Verse 25. Now his older son was in the field and he came out and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. and Your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. Then he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you. I've never disobeyed your command. Yet you gave me a young goat. You never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this brother, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Let's pray together. Uh, and so Father, we've read this part of your scriptures and, and some scriptures before looking and pertaining to joy. And what we are really keen for is that we would have understanding. Um, not just so we'd be built up uh, with knowledge or in knowledge, but so that we'd know your heart for us, your character, your goodness, your kindness, and even your own joy, who we are, who we are in Christ, who we are as you are doing a work in us by your Holy Spirit uh, to produce joy in us and through us and what that looks like in the world. And so help us have understanding today. In Jesus' holy name, amen. So this is, you would have heard, the, if this is the first church like gathering or service you've ever been to, still you likely have heard of the story of the prodigal son. The story of the son who demanded his, of his dad, treated his dad like he was dead. Oh, you are dead to me, dad. I just want what's coming to me. I want what's mine. And I'm going to go off and I'm going to forge my own path. I'm going to do my own thing. <clears throat> squanders it all with reckless living. And when the famine comes, when hard times come, he's ill-prepared, comes back to his father, just asks his father, let me be a servant, let me be one of your slaves. At least your slaves have food to eat. I have no food. This is what he's saying. Uh, and, and yet the dad, seeing him a long way off, filled with compassion and love, runs to his son, interrupts his little prepared speech, like wraps his arms around him, gets the fattened calf, gets his family ring, uh, gets the... the the nice robes, put in, the robes of, uh, robes of sonship, puts them on his son and has a great party. Goes out to the older brother. Older brother does not want to come in because he feels slighted that, although he's done everything right in his own mind, um, his little brother who squandered everything has been received back with open arms and there's, there's joy in the family. Very, very well known. Uh, you have likely, especially if you've been around church for a while, you've been a Christian for a while, you would have likely heard many things preached out of here. What I want to look at is just to, to zoom in on the joy factor. What is it in here that, that tells us, shows us, explains to us a little bit more about our joy, the Father's joy, and what that means for us in our lives today? And if we're looking at what does the world need now? The world needs more joy. The world needs more joy havers, and the world needs more joy bringers. And it is my, again, contention today that you are someone, if you're in Christ, full of joy. And if you would exercise that joy, you can bring that joy to a world that is in desperate need of your joy. Let's have a look. Here's some keys to Jesus' story of the prodigal son with relation to joy. The son comes back and says, would you make me your servant? Not give me something. He, as, as the son approaches the father, and in this case, yes, the father is representative of our father in heaven. As the, as the son goes to the father and, and he doesn't say, give me something, give me food to eat, give me what I need. Uh, he has been through it. He has tried that. He's tasted of that kind of way of relating to the father. And he sees it leads to death, actually. He's coming back and he's saying, no, make me a part of your household again, but even just the lowliest, the servant. 
he realized even my father's servants are treated better with this. And we see the father's heart filled with joy, not that his money's come back, none of that money's come back, but only his son has come back and only his son is what he wanted. He wanted a relationship with his son and he is filled with joy. And you hear this uh, a few times dotted throughout the thing, uh, dotted throughout this um, uh, passage. He, he, as soon as he sees him, he runs to him. His heart is just filled with love and longing for his son's embrace. Uh, his son has no idea what's going to happen. His son is thinking, if my father would just look upon me with a little bit of favor, I'll be the lowest of the low and treated like one of his lowly slaves. And yet he comes, his father wraps his arms around him, uh, like girds up his loins, um, grabs his, his cloak and like wraps it around him so that he wouldn't trip over it so he could run faster towards his son. And he's overjoyed. He's overjoyed. It says, they began to celebrate. I just, uh, I imagine the dad like jumping, or we've already seen him um, running towards the sun. I can see him like dancing around or, you know, fist pumping in the air. Like, yes, my son has come back. I feel with joy. That he, he, tried, he does everything he can. Put the ring on him. Get the robe on him. Get the, the calf that we have been overfeeding so that it would be nice and juicy and fat and delicious. It is his last day today because we must celebrate. In fact, uh, towards the end, when he's entreating his son, his other son, he's going to his son and saying, please, son, come in and celebrate with us. Your, your brother has returned as if from the dead. And it says, it is fitting to celebrate and be glad. Man, we need to celebrate. There are times for celebration. And his joy was so overflowing and bubbling over. He said, this is one of those times we must celebrate. It's not always a time to celebrate. It's not always a time to celebrate. Like we'll see today, there is, it is always a time for joy. I'll show, you, I'll show you how, even though we can have joy in the midst of incredible sorrow, in the midst of very difficult circumstances. And I know some of you are going through very difficult circumstances now, certainly around the world. There has never been a time when there's not been someone going through very difficult circumstances or even whole people groups who haven't been going through very difficult circumstances. And yet, what Scripture tells us is we can have Joy to the full, overflowing joy even, in the midst of those kinds of circumstances. The older son says, I worked for you like a slave because he approached the father as if he was a slave, not a son. He approached the father in this transactional kind of way. We're talking to him about how do you lose your joy? Or how do you not engage or operate out of the joy that you have in Jesus? Here we have another son, still has the same, like, uh, the same claim to the father, if you like, as sonship as the other son. This son approached him like a slave. Uh, and he said, I will do something for you if you do something for me. And when he sees the other son being treated with grace and mercy and love and forgiveness, it, it, it kind of betrays in him how he's been approaching his father. He's saying, well, I approached you in this transactional kind of way and he's done nothing. In fact, worse than nothing, he wanted, you, he, he wanted to approach you as if you were dead uh, and now you are killing the fattened calf. You never even gave me a little goat to celebrate with my friends. And look how I've slaved for you. Someone who approaches God as a slave and not as a son cannot be happy for somebody else's celebration because they have no joy in being a son. Such an important thing. Well, actually, we'll get back to this. The slave is always in want. The slave always has to try to earn something. The slave is never given something. The servant is never given something. The servant always has to earn Something. Not so with the son. Who we are, we are like the first son. Uh, uh, my hope is. In fact, we, I put it to you, we, we are more like the first son. We approach God with joyful praise and joyful living because we've been forgiven absolute rebellion and been made sons and daughters. Where does our joy come from? Uh, again, I'll put it to you and, I, and I'll show you in a minute. Our joy comes from being found in God, um, having fellowship with the Holy Spirit, being found in Christ, like being treated as sons and as daughters, but not because of something we've earned, not because we have a transactional relationship with God, but because, precisely because He has brought us into His family and treats us like sons and daughters. What takes away our joy? <clears throat> like the older son, bitterness will take away your joy. Bitterness will rob you of joy. If you refuse to join uh, in another celebration, uh, that's, that's craziness. He, 
he could have had grace and mercy and been like the father and approached his brother like the father approached his brother, he also would have been filled with joy. If he had approached his family, not transactionally, but relationally, uh, he too would have been filled with joy. Uh, Tim Keller, he talks about bitterness is believing God got it wrong. So when you believe God got it wrong, we're like, this is what would have been the best, objectively best thing for my life, and God did not give me that thing. Therefore, I am bitter towards God because he got it wrong. Doesn't he know? If God, if God knew, surely he would have done what I think is best for my life. Or how come God seems to be giving this person really good circumstances or good outcomes or they try to do things or have good relationships and they get them and I do seemingly the same things. Or I'm over here like doing the right thing all the time and yet I never get those kinds of things. Bitterness will absolutely rob you of your joy. Comparison will rob you of your joy. He has this. I have nothing. The father's trying to tell him, you have everything. Everything I have is yours. And the second son is, the oldest son is like, well, I like... I have nothing. You give me nothing. And the father's like, everything. You have everything. Second son comes along. He literally had nothing. And he comes back and he's so blessed by the father. He finds joy and celebration in the father purely by being a son. Remember, he still lost everything, but he's gained back the father. Comparison will rob you of joy. Having something other than God at the center of your world, I mean, really will rob you of joy at some stage. Maybe not... At the beginning, or at least maybe not, won't rob you of temporal happiness at the start, uh, but eventually will. When we try to uh, place our hope for joy in things that cannot bear the weight of handling our hope for joy, uh, those things eventually crumble under the weight. He didn't, the second son didn't value his relationship with the father, only valued what the father could give him. So his joy was dependent on what the father gave him, not on his relationship with the father itself. And so he lacks joy because he doesn't get what he really wants, which is the goat or the party with his mates. Whereas the first son gets his father. Uh, Only looking at his lack, not what he has. This is another way to lose your joy. Uh, if you heard this, the saying, count your blessings, I actually love that. I know it's cliche, it's old school, uh, but I like that. Practicing gratitude and thankfulness is an excellent way to, I mean, maximize living in your joy, to realize how phenomenal your life is, even with just relationship with the Father. And then everything that He gives and brings and everything else that will be added on to you when you seek first the kingdom. Selfishness will always kill your joy. Lastly, meaningless things. So putting, again, putting, attaching your joy to meaningless things. Don Miller, he said, It occurs to me, it is not so much the aim of the devil to lure me with evil as it is to preoccupy me with the meaningless. What he's saying is that the, way to, uh, the best way to draw me away from my affection and joy in the Father is to try to make other things look really shiny. Make other things look really joy-giving so that I take my attention and affection and joy-finding away from God and the things of God and onto other things, even, even good things, some other kinds of pursuit. So I ask you, uh, what weight is it that is preventing you from living in light of the joy you have in Jesus? What is it? Hebrews 12 says this, uh, we are surrounded By so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. What weight is keeping you from your joy? Is it? trying to like be cool? Is it trying to have like this veneer or projected image of yourself to the world? You have to try to like curate and craft this brand, your, your own personal brand. Um, is it comparison? Is it clinging to bitterness? Uh, is, it, is it sin? Is it actually um, putting something else in the place and, and weight of God in your life, looking to sin or some sinful pursuit to provide joy for you? 
How do you lose your joy? You lose your joy by losing your gospel freedom. How do you lose your gospel freedom? By becoming once again a slave to sin. Scripture tells us this, I mean, over and over again. Even though Jesus has rescued you from being a slave to sin, if you look for purpose or happiness or meaning or comfort or direction or identity or fulfillment or passion or perfection in anything other than Jesus, necessarily your joy will always be dependent on how that thing is going or how you're going in that thing. Consider Jesus. Even in this passage we just looked in Hebrews, you do not need to lose your joy, even in dire circumstances. Let's read this again. You you can have genuine sorrow alongside wholehearted joy. It says of Jesus, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He endured the cross for the joy set before him. I don't know if you've ever thought about joy as something you have to endure. Like, oh, I endured that uh, really nice steak or wine. I endured uh, jo- like play- joyfully playing with my kids. Uh, th- you know, those kinds of things. I-, I don't know if you've ever like, I really endure, I had to endure listening to that really great piece of music. We just don't use this kind of language because we tend to associate uh, joy with pleasant circumstances. That we could not have some sort of dire circumstance or even maybe even be in a situation like we're in now across the globe to varying degrees. Uh, in social and like geographical, physical isolation, uh, even relational isolation for many, still some fear of of sickness or what's going to happen. How do we like some trepidation and kind of going back, taking steps back to um, like opening up our lives to to physical proximity and and kind of regular things that we were doing before. Um, all those kinds of things we tend to contrast that with joy. We say, well, I, I, I want my joy. And so that what we do is, if we're just thinking about it like this, we attach joy only to positive or comfortable or um, easy circumstances or events. Whereas we see in Jesus, even through genuine sorrow, still full of joy. Your joy, if you're in Christ, your joy is not attached to your circumstances. If you're in Christ, your joy is not attached to your ears of life. It's not attached to having easy relationships, um, good vocation. I'm not not saying this doesn't make those things hard. I'm definitely not saying uh, life is not difficult. Again, we look to Jesus in his example for the joy set before him. He endured the cross, physical agony, mental anguish, and bearing the weight of the sin of the world at the same time. And yet, for the joy set before him. And Hebrews again says, following after his example, we throw off every weight. The things that would burden us, would remove us from our joy. The sinful pursuits, we want to cast all of them away. It's not going to make your life easier necessarily, but it will enable you to walk in joy. So what gives us joy then? Consider the younger brother. Blew all of his money, (laughs) it's all gone, uh, and comes back knowing how far he had fallen and how much the father loved him anyway. Welcomes him, lavishes goodness and kindness and mercy upon him. Refuses, the father refuses to relate to him as a slave and instead clothes him as a son. This is one of the, if you can, I mean, if you can I mean, really live in light of this in the way that your heavenly Father views you, the affection God has for you, the love God has for you, He does not treat you as a slave. He doesn't view you as a servant. He does not have a transactional relationship with you. As if we had some sort of gospel of works where you had to do certain things and get good enough. And then if I could just get good enough, then God, or He has to love me because I'm good enough, but then God's love for me is always determined by maintaining this goodness that is not how God relates to you. He doesn't relate to you as a slave. He relates to you as a son, as a daughter. He loves you. When, when the sinner repents, Scripture tells us that heaven celebrates. 
the same kind of celebration. It is right that we celebrate because this person has turned from their sinful ways. And the father, I mean, figuratively in this case, runs, wraps his arms around the son, or maybe in your case, the daughter, who was far, who was dead, but is now alive. Do, do you understand this? Because the father views you as a son and a daughter and not as a slave, and we don't earn God's love, but he is giving you his love, means that we don't consider or try to discern God's love for us based on our circumstances, but based on what he has done for us in Jesus. We know he is always fully, fully for you. You have to earn his favour, you have his favour. Then if you earn his love, you have his love. Imagine the son's joy. Uh, I saw this, um, I don't know if you've seen this, uh, like, miniseries uh, called The Chosen. I just saw this one little clip. Uh, it's, it's about the life of Jesus. This one little clip where this leper comes to him, uh, it's from Scripture, and says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And there's this like pause, and then Jesus bends down to him and says, I'm willing. And I, that, when I saw that, I was just like, oh my goodness. Imagine being the leper in that moment. Jesus says, I'm willing. Imagine being the son. He's got this, uh, this whole speech prepared and the father just comes and says, forget your stinking speech. You're not a slave, you're a son. Come here. That's how the father, that's how he views us, how he, how he treats us. If the son's joy is dependent on the character of his father and not on anything that he has done, good or bad, to deserve or to earn it, then the son is in no risk of having that joy taken away. If, if your joy is wholly dependent on the character and love of your heavenly Father, and he does not change. And it's not got to do with you, good or bad. It's not got to do with you earning it, but wholly dependent on what Jesus has already accomplished. Then if you're in Christ, nothing can take away your joy. This is the most beautiful truth to live in light of. What brings joy? Knowledge of who we are in Jesus and relationship with the Father. In verse 32 here, it literally means it was necessary to celebrate. Like, we have to party. We cannot not party because the Son has come back. We can't not party. Brings us joy to know we have a future, to know we can actually have restored and good relationships with one another, to place, our, to place God rightly where he, where he should be, as most weighty, as ruler over our lives. That gives us joy. You, th- you may think the opposite is true. If your view of God is as an overbearing kind of father, not as a loving, gracious, like life-giving, joy-bringing father. It means being joyful in suffering. It means being joyful in celebrating. It means being joyful as we give and serve and, and, and like pour out our lives in service to one another and to God. Is being joyful in praise. Is being joyful in our lifestyle, meaning things like we don't harbor bitterness. We actively work against comparing. Means when good things happen to other people, even maybe people we don't like, we can celebrate for them and even pray that God would act well and good circumstances would fall before people that that we know, we like, we don't like. We just don't compare ourselves with other people anymore. It doesn't happen. We say things, we communicate in a way that builds up and doesn't tear down because our heart is full of joy. Our mouths or our like fingers as we type overflow with joy. Does that make sense? If your heart is full of joy or bubble up and come out of your heart is joy. If your speech tears down, it's bitter. It's just trying to make yourself look good. Um, I mean, we need to repent of these things. And even in the repentance, uh, that can bring joy. You can receive joy. Uh, remembering that preaching the good news to ourselves is a way to remind ourselves of the joy we have and even builds up that joy as well. Remind us that we have full access to the Father, that He loves us completely, just like He loves His perfect Son, Jesus. Here's the deal. Verse 28, the Father comes and entreats. He urges, He implores the older brother. He says, Come and join the celebration. The father doesn't want anyone to miss out on the celebration. He's imploring the other brother. Come on. Let's celebrate. We we must. We can't not celebrate. If you're finding you have a lack of joy, um, 
It could be tied up with you just trying to hold on to past pains. It could be due to some um, unforgiveness or bitterness. Uh, it is time to forgive those things. We've talked about this a lot, a lot before. Forgiveness doesn't mean you have to trust a person again. Forgiveness means you're no longer holding on to that hurt. Uh, hold, throw off every weight that's holding you back and cling to the joy that is found in Jesus. The Father says, Come, like the psalmist wrote, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And let's go and join the Father in the great celebration of what His Son has done and welcoming us into His family of joy. Let's invite others into the same family of joy. Let's pray together. Father God, I want to thank You for Your Son, Jesus. Thank You for how You have uh, acted upon us with such great love, undeserving, ill-deserving love. Just like this prodigal son, we have failed you in such, I mean, horrendous ways, rebelled against you in such horrendous, horrendous ways, when all you've shown us is love. Our hope, our greatest hope is in Jesus. Help us not to anchor or attach our hope or our joy to any lesser thing. Help us like uh, that that first son who comes back, um, to come back and, I mean, jettison our idea of trying to earn your love or your favour and just receive your love and your favour. That you clothe us as a son or as a daughter, that we would, uh, we would like wrap and cling to that cloak tightly, wear that family ring, um, stand and sit in your embrace. Father, it is right that we celebrate the joy and the hope we have in Jesus, in being in your family and knowing your love. For those of us who struggle to receive and accept that love, that unmerited love, uh, would you help us by your spirit to receive it, to, to I guess, even soak in it, live in light of it, um, speak in light of it, make decisions in light of it, come before you in light of it, uh, treat other people in light of it. Um, praise and worship you with our very lives in light of what you've done for us. Father, again, fill us with your joy and may our words, our lips, um, our writing overflow, uh, just spill over with this joy that we have in you. In Jesus' holy name we ask. Amen. We are going to uh, gather around the table now. We're going to, uh, with the bread, remember Jesus' body. With the cup, remember his blood. Rem reminding ourselves, uh, commemorating what he's done and reminding ourselves that, again, we, we have done nothing to earn God's love or favour. We do this every single week. Even though we're, we're scattered at the moment, this is not like, truly communion because we're not, we're not really all together. Uh, like Scripture tells us to be. So this is kind of a picture or, or a longing of when we can come together again and participate around these elements again. And yet, it's still right that we remember every week what Jesus has done for us. Um, if you are in Christ, in your families, please like participate around these elements. Remember what He's done. And in these, remind yourself that you don't earn the love of God. He gifts it to you because it was earned by Jesus. If you're not in Christ, you don't know Jesus, uh, this is, I believe, God making His invitation to you now, even through me, uh, through this screen, um, that He is imploring you, urging you to come to the celebration. Uh, come and know the joy and the peace and the hope of Jesus' finished work that you don't have to earn His love. That you can't earn His love. It's impossible for you to earn His love. Possible for me to earn His love. And thank God for Jesus who has done the work uh, that for those who repent, that means turning away from your old way of life, like unthroning yourself from uh, the throne of your own life, coming under God's way of, of thinking, um, 
repenting means like you know, even saying sorry for the way you'd lived before, kind of like that, that prodigal son does coming back to his dad. Uh, the, the end result of that is um, when we turn from our old ways and we come under Jesus' Lordship, uh, we are in His family. God welcomes us into His family. He throws the robe over you. He puts the ring onto you. He says, come into the celebration. Come into the rest of knowing there's no more striving to try to earn God's love for you. It's wonderful, wonderful news. Um, there's no money to give. There's no big list of accomplishments you have to achieve. There's no threshold of goodness you've got to get over. Uh, it's this free gift of grace in Jesus. You turn, again, like the, like the prodigal son, turn from our old way, come back to the Father and receive His goodness. Uh, if that's you today, can I, can I ask you, would you um, connect with us? Go to cedarlight.church forward slash connect. Uh, we'd love to connect with you, help you understand what it looks like to live in the joy and freedom of knowing Jesus. Uh, if you know a Christian, call them even now. Um, to, you know, text them, Facebook them, say, hey, I, I need to know. How, what does it look like for me to become a Christian? How do I walk in this freedom that Don was talking about? Uh, and would you join us as we sing to God uh, and even sing to our own hearts of the goodness and the greatness of the love of God?